Porsche Co. presents Tales from the Black Box. Episode 3, The End of Us, Part 1. Written by Connor Walsh. Narrated by Stefan Weibel. Additional voices provided by Harrison Mark, Connor Walsh, and Shannon O'Hara. For some people, waking up in the morning is one of the hardest things to do. Some people stay up way too late. Some people deal with anxiety in the morning. Some people don't look forward to the day ahead. And for Colin, it was all of the above. Each night, he struggled to go to sleep, finding little solace with each passing day. He felt like a hollow shell, blindly walking through empty days. It had been weeks since the last time he'd cleaned his room, let alone cleaned up anything. Most nights, he would come home, and toss his clothes onto the floor. There are a few open areas, like little lily pads strewn about on a pond for a frog to hop across. In the bathroom, the mirror was blurry with dust, dried water droplets, and smudge marks. Colin didn't mind. He'd rather not look straight at himself anyway. In the cup on the faucet sat two toothbrushes, one of which had not been used in months. It lingered there, collecting dust and moisture. Small lines of mold had begun to grow in the little grooves on the handle. In the kitchen, mountains of dishes could be found in the sink and on top of the stove, each sporting layers of cooked-on grease. Over on the counter laid empty pizza boxes, meatball subcontainers, McDonald's bags, and various other to-go packages. On top of all the garbage were paper plates, bowls, and cups. Colin grabbed a bowl and opened the utensil drawer. He looked inside to see there were no utensils. Colin reached into the mountain of dollar store ceramic dishes and found a spoon to rinse off. He searched above the refrigerator to grab a half-empty box of Honey Nut Cheerios. Inside the refrigerator, he retrieved the gallon of milk. Colin read the expiration date. Two days passed. He opened it up to smell the contents of the gallon. Not noticing anything out of the ordinary, he proceeded to pour the milk into his bowl of Cheerios. He trudged his way to his living room, placing the cereal on his coffee table and snatching the television remote. The news popped on. Colin reached for his phone in his pocket to aimlessly scroll Facebook and Instagram as he did every morning, but it was nowhere to be found. He looked around to find no phone in sight. He got up to go search for his phone. As he leaves, the program continues. We are coming to you live about the historical supervolcanic event which started several hours ago. What started out as unpredicted volcanic activity in the Phlegrean fields near Naples, Italy, has spread to other areas. The activity has already leveled towns and cities worldwide. Millions of people have been killed, with many more displaced. Scientists believe this phenomena is far from over, with predictions of more earthquakes reaching magnitudes of 6.8 and greater. Seismologists have no idea what has triggered this activity, but what is certain is that the effects are, and will continue to be, catastrophic. Many of us have asked ourselves, if we knew the world was about to end, how would we spend our last day? Would you call your parents? Make amends with an old enemy? Call up your best friend? For Colin, none of these questions crossed his mind. The only thing rushing through his mind was one particular conversation, one that he had been trying to forget for months. I don't know if I can keep doing this. I knew the distance was going to be tough, but this is worse than I thought. Kat, we, we started our relationship at a distance. This isn't a death sentence. It's not the same. You can't keep saying that we started at a distance. That doesn't matter. Come on, we knew distance was eventually going to be an issue again. We agreed we were going to work on it. I know, and I'm trying. But that doesn't mean that this isn't hard. You know me. I'm the kind of person who needs to be with my partner. Too many things are changing, and I don't know how to handle it. Colin, I'm, I'm scared. I know. I, I am too. I love you. I, 
love you too. It had been a while since Colin revisited this conversation. However, right after they happened, it felt like it was tattooed in his mind. People say that they see their lives flash before their eyes in their final moments, reliving core memories which shaped them. Birthdays, holidays, victories, losses, regrets. In Colin's mind, he only saw Catherine, the one that got away. What do you want? I don't know. This isn't the first time we've had this discussion. And it's been happening more and more recently. I think you know what you need, but you're afraid to do it. And I know what you need, but I don't want to let go. If you knew you were living your last few moments, wouldn't you try to make things right? That's all that was on Colin's mind. It had been months since Colin and Catherine had talked, let alone seen each other. Yet everything that Colin had done since was influenced by their time together. Never had he ever met someone who had such an impact on him, an impact he couldn't let go of. This is never what I wanted. <laughs> Please, don't let us do this. Can't we just keep loving each other? Is what Colin wished he had said. He wished he said something that would have made her stay. Instead... So, is this it? This was never supposed to happen this way. Colin was surprised how quiet the roads had been so far. Though he hadn't gotten too far away from his neighborhood yet, he figured that everyone would be freaking out. He would have thought that more families would be rushing into their cars, packing up the families, and trying to get somewhere safe. However, it looked as though everything remained untouched. He only witnessed a few of those, but he figured there would be more. Perhaps more people just stayed settled inside, surrounded by loved ones, making the most of the final moments. Maybe they were calling loved ones far away. Perhaps parents were trying not to worry their kids. Colin couldn't help but think of scenes from the movie Titanic. He remembered the scene where the mother tucked her kids in to sleep, trying to keep them calm while she knew there was little hope. He also thought of the scene with the elderly couple, refusing to leave each other's sides, neither wanting to live without the other. And that's what Colin wanted. He needed to see Catherine. Despite the time that had passed, his heart still drew him back to her. That was the only place he felt he belonged. There had been so many things he wished he could say to her again. He wished he could apologize for all that had happened. None of that mattered now. All he wanted was to see her one last time, and if he were lucky, hold her in his arms. Many nights, he wished he could let her go. He tried not to love her, but he couldn't. As Colin drove towards the outskirts of his neighborhood, he glanced over at the park. It was dead quiet besides what looked like an elderly couple sitting on a bench overlooking the bank of the pond. They just sat there. It didn't look like they were talking or anything. All Colin could see as he passed was the woman's white hair resting upon the overcoat of the gentleman. They had nowhere else to be but there with each other. Colin recalled times he would take Catherine to that park for walks, picnics, and late night talks. What'd I tell you? Great place, right? I'll admit, you do choose some nice spots. It's been a while since we've been able to have a weekend like this. I'm glad I could steal you away for a bit, you workaholic. <laughs> I don't assign the work. I just get it done. And it's not like you've had all the free time in the world lately, not since you started working at the animal shelter. Hey, I started a few weeks ago. You've had this job for several months. Even still, I have more time than you. Touche. But how can I not take advantage of a day like this? The sun is shining, the birds are chirping. Oh, it feels like absolutely everything is right with the world. <laughs> You're such a dork. Yeah, but you love that. I do. 
Hey, let's take a seat over here. I want to show you the spot. Okay. Ain't it gorgeous? I love coming here. It feels like time just stops whenever I visit. I feel like I'm constantly on the go and hardly get a chance to smell the roses, so anytime I can escape here, I take advantage of it. Actually, this is one of the first times in a while that I've come during the day. Most of the time I'll come around midnight just to stroll. It's so still then. There's a purity to the night that's hard to explain. It's peaceful. During the day, I feel like I'm bending every which way, doing all different things, but then when I come here, it's like the whole rest of the world ain't there. I could sit here for hours. You know, when we started talking, I would sit on this park bench when we'd have those late night phone calls. Aw, that's so adorable. It's a gorgeous park. It reminds me of this one park that I had back home. We would all go down as a family and we would bring feed for the ducks. There was this one time when I was really little that this family of ducks took a liking to me. A couple of the little ducklings would follow me around even when I walked away from the pond. They were just so cute. I wanted to take them home so bad. <laughs> I could see your folks appreciating that. Oh, I begged my dad to let me take them home. I had it all planned out. I would use our little blow-up pool and fill that with water, and I could build a little nest within an old cardboard box, and all of this would be in my room, so it was just me taking care of them. They were just so cute. <laughs> you really thought that through. I was ready to be a proud mother duck. I would have treated them so well. I know you would have. But how do you think they would have fared with the dogs? And that's what Dad said. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Ruby and Lady would have appreciated them at the time. They were still getting used to each other. Yeah, I bet. Well, that looks like a good one. What are you doing? I'm looking for rocks to skip. Back home, growing up by the river, I would go down and skip rocks for hours. Can you show me? You've never skipped rocks before? I've tried, but I can never figure it out. All right, let's do this. I got a couple of good rocks here for you. We'll start with these. All right, so a lot of people think it's more in the arm, but it's mostly in the wrist. Essentially, you give a good flick of the wrist when you stop your arm. Here, I'll show you. Impressive. Seven skips. All right, your turn. Oops. <laughs> it's all good. Here, I'll guide you through the motions. Now, when you stop here, you'd flick your wrist. Is this your equivalent to that cliche mini golf move? Maybe. Is it working? All right, you got the motion. Try it again. Hey, three skips, that's awesome. Oh wow, there's a deer over there. Oh my gosh, where? Right over there. Oh, it looks like a baby. I'm going to say hi. Wait, what? I know animals are your thing, but it's still a wild deer. It just doesn't seem right. Take it easy. We would get deer all the time in our garden back home. I would go out and feed the little fawns sometimes. A couple of them would even let me pet them. Okay, but this ain't one of those deer. I, I don't know, I wouldn't do it if I were you. Hey there, little guy. It's okay. You're a cutie, aren't you? You want some berries? I'll get you some berries. Oh, you're such a sweetheart, aren't you? There you go. It's okay, you can take them. <laughs> it tickles. It's okay, you're good. Well, I'll be damned. I always knew you were a Disney princess, but this practically confirms it. Colin couldn't help but grin again as he remembered the goofy smile on his face watching her feed the deer. He always admired how pure Catherine's heart was. He knew that she hadn't always had it easy, and she had gone through enough in the past, yet she always remained on top. She always maintained this purity to her that couldn't be altered. It was too good to be true. Colin felt that often. At times, he would try to look for flaws in her, any ounce of darkness, but there were hardly any to find. What he saw was what he got, and he felt that he took advantage of that. Looking back at the park, now getting smaller in his rearview mirror, he admits to himself that he had no idea how good he had it with her. She was more than he could ask for. Colin pulled up to a red light, he wondered if it's even worth following the rules of the road, considering the circumstances. Another car pulled up beside him on his right. The car looked like it could have been driven right off the lot. It was spotless and stuck out like a sore thumb in the suburban environment. He took a look to see the driver of the car furiously yelling into a cell phone. The man's hair was all messy, as if he'd been pulling at it. Colin could imagine that normally it was well slicked and parted on the side, but not that day. 
the driver kept tugging at the tie around his neck as if he were trying to loosen a noose. His buttoned up shirt was stained with armpit sweat and what Colin would assume was a coffee stain in the center. Colin was entranced by the driver. What could he possibly be ranting about over the phone? Whatever business he had up to this point, it didn't matter now. The end of the world really equalizes everyone, Colin thought. The day prior, this man was probably very successful in his field. Given the beautiful car and nice clothes, Colin pictured this man as a lawyer, banker, or some other kind of high-powered, white-collar socialite. Today, Colin thought, none of that success mattered. Just like many of the cities that Colin had heard about on the news, everything this driver built had come crumbling down. Did he have a family? Was that who he was talking to on the phone? Or was he still discussing business? Could this man get over himself for a few moments to take in the gravity of the events surrounding him? Or was he still imprisoned by the little world he had created for himself? Colin searched his car to see if there were any stickers, decorations, toys, anything to show there was more to this man than just business. Nothing. The car looked pristine, as if the leathered seats had never been sat on by another soul. Colin proceeded to focus on the driver, his left hand gripping the steering wheel. He was not wearing a ring or any jewelry for that matter. The driver looked over at Colin. His eyes widened even further in rage and it looked like he began yelling at Colin for staring. The driver honked a couple times, flipped Colin off and accelerated into the intersection. A large truck plowed through the car's beautiful exterior, spinning it out of control. The car looked more like a spinning top than an automobile. The truck kept moving through it as if it were a sad piece of roadkill. The truck continued down the street as the car stopped turning. Colin was dumbfounded by what he had just watched. He felt like time slowed down and that he was in a trance as the car pulled out into the center of the intersection and was mowed down. Colin unbuckled and got out of his car. He rushed over to the once pristine vehicle, watching out for the shattered glass on the ground. He could hear other cars coming to a halt behind him, curious to observe the scene. Colin heard a crunch from below him. He stopped for a moment to notice he stepped on a crushed smartphone. As Colin got to the driver's door, he saw that the majority of the windows had been shattered. In the driver's seat, the man lay lifeless with his eyes open and his head cocked to the side. Blood ran down from his forehead as his torso was covered in glass. In his neck and chest, it looked as if tiny shards had made their way into the man's flesh. Folders and papers were scattered all over the car with the ones closest to the driver stained with red. Colin stood there for a moment. He did not touch the man or do anything to see if he was still alive. It was obvious that he was gone. There was nothing more that could be done. Shaking, Colin walked back to his car. By this point, several other people got out of their cars to see what was going on. A woman to Colin's left was hyperventilating and crying. Another person on his right was trying to call a paramedic. Colin did not address any of them and walked back into his car, buckled up, and continued to drive on. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate you taking the moment to answer my questions. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Nah, I've been there myself. Trust me, just the other day, uh... Surprise. Hey. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> just the other day I was hit with two meetings out of the blue, so I totally get what you're saying. I'm... Yes, thank you. You as well. Have a good day now. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> what are you doing here? I was able to get out a little early today. I even got you a peach iced tea. Oh my god, I love you so much. <sighs> That's exactly what I needed. Thank you. You're welcome. Love you. I thought this was perfect because I remember you said you had a late day today, and since I got out early, I was wondering if we could grab a quick meal and eat it at the park. <sighs> I, I would love to, but some things came up. Amanda had to reschedule her meeting from this morning to this afternoon, and then Penn asked me to help him get some stuff together for the event this Saturday. I'm sorry, this day just filled up. I don't think I can go. It's okay. I understand. 
How about we save that for dinner then? We could head over to the pizza place by the park. You can get your broccoli tomato slice and I'll get my square. Yeah, uh, pizza sounds good, but I'm not sure if we can take it in the park. Because uh, of the meeting now, I won't have the time to finish up the report for tomorrow. So I'm going to have to take it home with me tonight. I'm not sure if I can break away to chill in the park tonight, but um, I most likely will have to work through dinner. But pizza still sounds good. Oh, okay. You'll need time to eat it, though. Can't you spare half an hour? I don't know. I just don't want to get sidetracked for too long and then spend more time there than we thought, and then it gets late all of a sudden, and then I'll be up all night putting the report together. I don't know, babe. Not this time. Maybe this weekend. You said that last weekend. I... I know. Things have been more hectic than I was expecting. I thought this one deal was going to close much easier than it has been. But it turns out it's been a huge pain in my ass. I can't control all these meetings, trust me. If it were up to me, I'd be walking out this door right now with you cuddling on a park bench. Unfortunately, time isn't a luxury I possess at the moment. That's fine. I get it. Um, here, I can order the pizza before you're home, so you don't have to worry about picking it up. You would do that? Oh, sweetheart, thank you. That would make things easier for me tonight. I appreciate it. And I'm telling you, this weekend, Sunday, Sunday, we'll spend an afternoon in the park or anywhere else you want to go. I'll make it up to you. I promise. Colin never did take her out that weekend, nor the weekend after. Something always kept creeping up that took his attention away. I'll make it up to you, I promise. He found himself saying that more and more as time went on. Luckily for Colin, Catherine was a patient and loving young woman. She understood that Colin had a lot on his plate. Though disappointed about plans not coming together, she believed in Colin. Colin, on the other hand, had guilt welling up inside of him. Though Catherine showed nothing but patience, Colin couldn't help but think of the grief he was putting her through. Colin would constantly beat himself up, telling himself that she deserves someone who could actually be there for her. As more and more time slipped away from them, he grew to believe that she deserved much better than him. His guilt consumed him. Even in the moments they could share together, he was plagued with a feeling of dread that she was harboring animosity against him. She never was, though. Yes, they had conversations about not getting to see each other, but it always came from a place of love. Anytime Catherine would bring it up, she would talk about how much she missed him. Colin would always come back and say that he was doing this all for the two of them. As he was driving down a more and more hectic street, Colin saw that the job and the money meant nothing to her. She loved him for who he was, not for any pay stuff that came in. All she wanted was to spend some time. And that was the thought racing through Colin's head as he was racing down the street. As Colin drove further into town, the scene got progressively more chaotic. Several times, Colin had come close to being in a collision. People were walking and running into the street without a care. Cars were piling up all around him as people were showing signs of hysteria. As he drove through Main Street, storefronts had been smashed in. People were looting businesses. What was the point of that, Colin wondered. Where were they to go, and what were these looters to do with their stolen treasures? You can't run from the inevitable. The one thing that we all share as humans is that, eventually, we die. Yet, how each individual approaches it is different. Colin observed as numerous folks were reverting to their primal instincts as they tore through the town. At this point, the destruction was not caused by any tremors or any natural disaster. It was the effect of man. Colin always hated traffic, especially in areas he wasn't used to. Colin practically knew this street like the back of his hand, but that day, it felt like no place he had ever been. Bobbing and weaving through crowds of raving savages did not make driving this time any easier. Honking the horn, yelling at people, and Swerving in every which way, Colin was getting more and more aggravated. Colin had always exhibited behaviors of road rage. Never up until now did he feel that he had anywhere more important to be. Babe, Babe. Babe are you all right? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. 
You know how I feel about driving in areas I'm not used to. I know, but it's okay. We're about 45 minutes out from my parents' place. And besides, my mom will have everything set for dinner whenever we get there. Yeah, I know. It's it's fine. You know, I just get tense. It's okay, Colin. You're doing fine. Thanks, Kat. So what does your phone say? Uh, when do we have an exit coming up? Uh, actually, in less than two miles. Less than two miles? Are you kidding me? I wish I knew that sooner. I'm blocked in. I'm sorry. Damn it! Nobody's letting me merge into the right lane. Damn it. Come on. I'll screw you two, buddy! Where the hell do you think you're going that's so important? It's okay, baby. Just calm down. Give me a second. God damn it, come on. Got my turn signal on. Can any of you fi- Are they giving licenses to the blind now? Baby. Come on, come on. Come on, let me in, let me in, let me in. Okay, you know what? Screw you two! Crap! I'm not gonna make it. It's okay, hun. Just merge. I'm trying! But everyone is speeding like maniacs! Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. God damn it, we missed it! Colin, it's okay. There will be another exit. See? It's rerouting. Okay, so this adds another 20 minutes to the drive, but there's another exit we can take. Another 20 minutes? You gotta be kidding me! We've been driving enough as it is! Damn it. Where's this exit? Another eight miles. Okay. I feel like you're mad at me. <sighs> oh, babe. No, 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 no. Oh, God. I'm sorry, Kat. You know how I get on the road. I, no, it's not my best side. I just want to get to your parents' house safely, but also timely and... <clears throat> I'm sorry. I, I don't like the side of you. There was this one time that my mom got really upset about something at work while driving my brothers and I. She wasn't paying attention and drove into the middle of the intersection. We were T-boned by an incoming car. Thankfully, my brothers and I got out of it with minimal injuries, but my mom was in the hospital for a while, and it was terrifying, and, and seeing this from you worries me. You never told me that. I never knew how. I'm sorry. You know we're good. I'm not mad at you by any means. Driving in unfamiliar places just gets to me and I'm only so concerned because I want to keep you safe. <laughs> I've told you when I'm by myself I tend to speed a bit more and be a little more assertive. <laughs> I don't like hearing that either, exactly. Especially since you got two tickets in the past four months. I know. Which is why I've been trying to be better. You mean a lot to me, and I'm not going to let any idiot driver do anything to you. And I'm not going to be that idiot driver either. I swear, once we get to your parents' house, all this tension will release, and I'll be better. Are we okay? Yeah, we're okay. The exit is coming up real soon. Thank you, baby. This has been The End of Us, Part 1. Written by Connor Walsh. Narrated by Stefan Feibel. Colin portrayed by Connor Walsh. Catherine portrayed by Shannon O'Hara. Additional voices by Harrison Mark. Produced and sound designed by Connor Walsh. Additional sound effects provided by freesound.org. To become a patron and support this channel, go to patreon.com slash Co. Porridge Co. presents Tales from the Black Box, an anthology series. Porridge Co. presents... Tales from the Black Box. Episode 4, The End of Us, Part 2. Written by Connor Walsh. Narrated.
narrated by Stefan Weibel. Additional voices provided by Harrison Mark, Connor Walsh, and Shannon O'Hara. Colin was caught in a pileup on the highway. The sounds of cars honking could be heard for miles. Looking within the cars surrounding him, he saw different stories playing out. In one car, he saw a single mother holding the wheel in one hand and trying to calm a baby in another. The two kids sitting in the back were watching what he assumed were tablets with headphones on. The children looked unfazed, yet there was enough fear in the mother's eyes for all of them. In another car, he saw who he presumed were all college-aged guys rocking out to a song in the car. They were head-banging and looked as if they hadn't had a care in the world. Colin rolled down in his window to try to hear what they were listening to, but the sounds of honking drowned out the music. In his rear-view window, he could see a family of five solemnly sitting. They were not frantic. The father had one hand on the wheel and another in his wife's hand. She clutched his hand with both of hers and raised it high enough for Colin to see over the dash. Three children in the back had their heads down, and it looked like they too were all holding hands. The father seemed the most emotional, as he was the only one speaking. Based on watching his delivery, Colin assumed they must have been praying. Every once in a while, the rest of the family would utter something, most likely Amen or something along those lines. Colin grew up Roman Catholic and could still remember a few prayers and responses, but he left most of that behind him. By the time he went to college, he felt he was losing his faith. By sophomore year, he gave up going to church entirely. It wasn't like anything in particular pushed him away, but that he got caught up with a new life he was carving for himself. It had been a while since Colin had even thought of God. Colin watched as the mother, who had been holding back tears, finally erupted. The children in the back broke from their stoic stances and opened their eyes. They shifted forward as much as possible as they tried to console their mother. The father turned towards her with loving eyes and said something that calmed her down rather quickly. With tears still in her eyes, she composed herself and it looked like she encouraged her husband to continue with the prayer. To his far left, Colin noticed this one sign on a window of a restaurant. The sign read, Free Meals. He could see the people almost celebrating inside. There wasn't any sign of grief or dismay, just love and laughter. Waiters were hastily bringing out meals to the few tables of patrons. An older couple, presumably the owners, were going around table to table, checking in on everyone. Only smiles could be seen on their faces as they greeted each and every one of their guests. How could all these people act so joyfully, knowing that at any moment we could all be blown away, he thought. Maybe they had all found something that Colin had been searching for. Is this it? Colin thought. He panicked. Not because of the earthquake itself, but the fear that he may never get to Catherine now. Colin gripped the console and the overhanging handle. Cars were shuffling in the street as the earth moved from under them. Street lights and power lines were swaying frantically. Transformers were bursting as light poles broke free from their positions. Several of the poles were collapsing on top of cars. A few ignited, raising flames. Drivers were hastily scurrying from their cars while trying to keep themselves upright. Colin looked back over at the restaurant. The power was out, yet he could still see people huddled under tables as the wall frames, lights, glass, and anything else that wasn't bolted down fell to the floor. Falling debris, explosions, and car alarms replaced the honking that had once consumed the air. Colin sat very tense, holding on for dear life. 
of a sudden, a crack emerged from the middle of the street, a couple dozen yards from where Colin's car was. The crack opened up and started swallowing cars. It began to rip down the street as if it were a zipper. Drivers were desperately trying to move their cars out of the way, but the congestion made it hard for much to happen. Cars on both sides of the lane were being engulfed. Noticing this, Colin shifted his car into reverse and slammed his foot on the gas. He barely swerved around the family behind him and somehow made it to the sidewalk, where he viciously made a K-turn and proceeded to drive away. The earthquake subsided, and so did the ground from opening up. From his rearview mirror, he could see that the cars that had fallen victim did not fall all too far, but were rather pinned on their sides within what looked now to be a large rut. Colin reached a side street where he turned onto it and proceeded to go down, hoping it would connect him to another main road. The side road led him into a neighborhood. The road was clear, but street signs and lights were down and trees had collapsed onto houses. A couple houses in particular looked like smoke was coming out from their windows, yet no one was running out. Based on the lack of cars he saw in driveways, Colin assumed most people from this neighborhood had evacuated. He meandered through the quiet neighborhood for a while until he found another main road. This was not as congested as the one he had been on prior, but was littered with fallen fast food restaurant signs, street lights, and a few trees. In the distance, he could see a bright blaze. It was a gas station. The entire station was up in flames. Even as he drove closer, it was hard to tell if any cars remained, for the roof above the filling stations had collapsed. The whole gas station was ablaze, but no sign of firefighters coming. The station would be left to burn out, possibly even spreading to nearby establishments. No one was coming to put out the fire. No one was coming to save the day. Colin's stomach sank as a feeling of loneliness and dread swept over him. Colin drove past the blaze. What else was there for him to do? Just like the driver, he left lying in his blood on the highway. What could really be done at this point, he thought. What could really be done? That thought branded itself in Colin's mind. Even if he did manage to meet up with Catherine, would she listen to anything he had to say? Would she even look at him? The more he drove, the more he felt like this was a bad idea. He wasn't always able to say the right thing back then. He wondered how he would do now. <laughs> you just love doing that, don't you? <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm happy to see a smile on your face. How are you holding up? Still bummed. I don't blame you. Like, I really thought I was going to get this promotion. I really let myself believe I was going to get it. I come in early every day, and I'm always the last to leave. There hasn't been one animal I haven't bonded with yet, and adoption rates have gone up since I've been there. And Cassidy gets it. Honestly, I see her on her phone more than anything. I hear you. She doesn't put in nearly as much of work as the rest of us. If Brandon or Sylvia got it, I'd probably feel different, but Cassidy? Ugh, it makes me so mad. Babe, sometimes it plays out that way. Unfortunately, when you're so good at a certain job, they'll be less inclined to promote you. You're saying I didn't get the promotion because I'm too good at my job? Partly, yeah. They might think you're invaluable where you are. But just because you didn't get this promotion, you may get another. There might be another position you'll be even more perfect for. Don't get too down. You have so much potential. I hate that word. Potential. Everyone keeps saying I have potential. No one says what I am now is enough. Everyone says my time will come. But when, though? All I've been doing is trying. I've been putting in the prep. And then when we were notified they're looking for another manager, I, I thought it was a sign. And then all of that fell right out from under me. She just walked in like that and got it. Are you mad at me? What? Are you mad at me too? You know, I just got my promotion a couple weeks ago and 
I really haven't been at the firm that long. Not like I don't put in the effort, but I'm sure there are other people who have been there longer who have been waiting for my new position. Not exactly like Cassidy, but I just walked in and rose up the ladder pretty quickly. Are you thinking about me the way you're thinking about Cassidy? Are you kidding me? Why would you bring this up? It's an honest concern. Why would you do that? I didn't once think about you like that. But now, I feel like you're just throwing the fact you got your promotion and I didn't in my face. No, no, that, that, that's not what I meant. That's how it feels. I was... Hi there. You guys ready? Do you know what you want? Yeah, but I probably won't get that either. Catherine! I'm sorry, it's... It's just been a rough day. Finding a radio station that had any music on was next to impossible. He scrolled through the entire dial without a song to be found. What he wouldn't do to listen to anything to take him out of this moment. Music had always been a great escape. Not just for himself, but for Catherine too. He could still remember late night car rides, holding hands with each other. Colin would always let Catherine grab the aux cord. Though Colin may not have enjoyed every song that she played, he couldn't help but smile when he heard her sing along to every word. There was an air of freedom in those moments. Colin reached out to the passenger's seat to rest his hand on a lap that hadn't been there for months. He kept turning the dial, hoping to find something to ease his mind. All that there was was static on the FM line. There wasn't a station around that was broadcasting. How could he blame them? He thought about the news broadcaster that he was watching earlier, curious if they were still there or if they had evacuated. If they were to stay up until the very end, it would be like a captain going down with his ship, steadfast in their passion through the very end. To have that kind of responsibility to something was almost unfathomable to Colin. Almost. Listening to broadcasters continue to freak out about the disasters. All of them saying the same things. He kept turning until he heard the song. That song. It had to be that song playing. Can I finally take off this blindfold yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> We're almost there. Where on earth did you take me? I felt like we drove all over the place. I couldn't take a direct route, then you might have figured it out. Figured it out? Where are we? Let me just get this door, and here you are. Okay, you can take it off. Oh my god, Colin! Colin recalled that moment vividly. Colin had brought Catherine to the place they had met, Darcy's Cafe. They both got jobs there one semester. Very quickly, they hit it off. They were happiest when they got shifts at the same time. By the time the semester was about to end and they were going to head home for the summer, Colin admitted his feelings to Catherine. It was not a very big cafe, but there was a gorgeous terrace in the back. Colin strung string lights around the fence and cleared out every table, except for one in the center of the stonework. He laid out a trail of rose petals to a table set for two in the center of the patio, accented by candlelight. How did you... You can thank Darcy. I called in a favor. I asked if and when there might be an available night to take this place over. <laughs> when I told her we were still together, she was bubbling over with excitement, raving about how cute we were just getting to know each other that spring. She said she could tell that we had that chemistry from the start. Colin, I don't know what to say. I know we're about a week early, but happy anniversary, Kat. Colin, this is wonderful. Thank you, baby. Happy anniversary. Before we sit down to a fine dinner, I have one more thing. May I have this dance? Is this what I think it is? That song that Darcy would play on repeat that you used to hate but eventually fell in love with? Yes, yes it is. You're so cheesy. Yeah, but you love it though.
Colin resented the city life. Colin was not a rural boy by any means, but he loved his suburbs. He loved the idea of living in a neighborhood, but still being within a 10 minute radius of a mall, grocery store, and a school. Just the right amount of space and accessibility. Cities were too crowded, too bustling, and too frantic for his style. Catherine grew up in a city. Colin understood the need to potentially work and commute in and out of a city, but he still wanted to live in a suburb on the outskirts. That was something they bickered about all the time. Colin used to think it was one of those cute arguments, and only focused on the fact that they were thinking of life with each other. Rarely would he notice that he was needling her too hard and putting down her ideas. As he made his way into the city, he found it funny how none of that mattered anymore. Suburbanite or metropolitan, upper class, middle class, lower class, none of that mattered. At this point, each person had the same chance of survival as the individual next to them. In someone's last moments, you truly see who they are. Driving through the city was a mess, much more than it would be in normal circumstances. People were running up and down the sidewalk like madmen, each one of them only looking after themselves. There was so much pushing and shoving, no one was helping anyone up off the ground. People were getting stepped on until they could make it over to the closest building to prop themselves up against. At a turn, amongst all the chaos, there was a scraggly looking man. Colin assumed he was homeless, for his jacket and pants were clearly beat up and hadn't been washed. The man's beard was gray and wild, reaching out in all directions. His leathery skin was stained by the sun. In his hand, he held a cardboard sign that said, Repent, the end is near. As he got a little closer, Colin noticed an addendum was written in the corner. It looked like it read, I told you so. Amongst all the disarray and confusion, something else caught his eye. As everyone had been running around and scattering, Colin saw a stunning woman in a red dress. She stuck out like a sore thumb. While the atmosphere of the whole day felt gray, she was the vibrant splash of color, adding variation to the palette. She strutted in her high heel shoes down the sidewalk as if she were on a runway. She sure had the beauty and the confidence to go along with it. She kept her head held high, and each stride she took was with power and grace. Where could she be going, Colin thought. Was she off to impress someone? Was she trying to win back an ex? Perhaps make someone jealous? Maybe she didn't wear that dress for anyone but herself. If she knew that she was gonna go out, might as well do it in style. Colin couldn't help but think of her motivations. Was she at peace, or did she have one last statement to make? The red dress was what burned in Colin's mind, even well after he passed her. It had been a while since he had seen a dress like that. Somewhere between all the existentialism, he slipped away once again into a memory that had haunted him for months. Colin, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at the gala? I was, but I couldn't stop thinking about you. Are you all right? You just left out of nowhere. I told you you didn't have to leave. I know, but something felt off. Did I say something? D did I do something? Are, are we all right? No, it was nothing you did. You know how I get with crowds. It was just more than I could handle tonight. Besides, those are all your people, not mine. I didn't want you to leave, though. I just needed a moment to catch my breath and have some space for a moment. I told you that. Yeah, I know, but this was supposed to be our night. You know, we've been talking about this for weeks. You bought that new dress. It was going to be our first time out in a while. We were going to dance and have a good time. And that's why I came. It's still our night. You keep saying that, but this was your event. Your night, not mine. I wanted you to have a good time still. How can I have a good time without my best girl by my side? Oh, this again. What again? You don't need me to have a good time. We were fine. 
As I said, it was overwhelming and I just needed to get out. And now you're making me feel bad for ruining your vision of a perfect night. That's not what I'm trying to do. But that's how you're making me feel. I wish you could just trust me when I say that we were all right and respect that I needed a moment to myself. I'm only trying to make sure we're all right. I'm here to help. No, you're trying to make sure that you are all right. You have to make sure that everyone likes you. You have to make sure your image is intact. And me deciding I want to go home and let you stay there to have a good time means to you that there is an issue. Your perfect dream night is ruined because you don't have a girl on your arm to show off. You always find a way to make things back to you. Where is this coming from? It's been building, Colin, for a while now. And I haven't said anything because I didn't want to hurt you. I know that you've been going through a lot with work, with all the events, with the loans, but you just dump it all on me, hardly giving me a chance to breathe. And whenever I try to bring up something that has been bothering me, you find a way to turn the conversation back to you. Kat, that's not what I'm trying to do. We said from the beginning of this relationship that we are both going to be open and honest with each other, which I've been trying to do. You know this doesn't come easy to me, but I trust you, and I'm trying so hard to be vocal about all my thoughts and feelings. But you're not leaving any room for me. Like, what about your promotion? When you asked if I was mad at you for getting yours when I didn't get mine? <laughs> Wait a second. I thought we were past this. I was genuinely worried. I knew how passionate you were about that manager position. I, I felt bad. I wasn't mad at you. I wasn't until you said something. And I wasn't upset you got that promotion. I was happy for you. I was proud of you. How could I not be? I was sad for myself and myself alone, but that was supposed to be my moment to be upset and vent, and you made the situation about you. I didn't need you to say anything or try to help. I needed someone to listen. I needed someone to hold me. I needed someone to ride out the storm with me, and instead of being there for me, you made it about you. Colin snapped back to reality. Glass from the windshield scattered in front of him. He could feel a line of blood running down his forehead. The airbag sucker punched him like a schoolyard bully. From over the airbag, peering through the shattered windshield, he saw another car rammed into the front of his car. Dazed, Colin tried to get himself together. He stumbled out of the car and observed the mess. His ears were ringing, yet he could still faintly hear the man from the other car yelling at him from his driver's seat. Colin looked at the man blankly as he continued to yell at him. All of a sudden, Colin broke into a full sprint down the road. Slowly regaining his hearing, he could hear more of the man yelling as he created more distance. No car crash was going to stand in his way from seeing Catherine one last time. It didn't matter how much his head was throbbing or how out of breath he was getting, he just ran down the street. Cars swerving all around him, people yelling at each other from buildings and sidewalks, yet Colin kept running straight as he slipped back into another memory. If everyone could find their seats, the award ceremony will start in about 10 minutes. Okay. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, I am pretty nervous. You're gonna be all right. You're being awarded the Exceptional Service Award. And it's even more impressive since you've only been here for seven months. Nobody has ever been awarded it that soon. Thanks. I appreciate it. What's wrong? None of my family are able to come to this, and Colin was originally supposed to come, but instead he's at traffic court several towns over fighting a speeding ticket. It was hard enough not having my family here, but it would have meant a lot having him here. <laughs> you may want to turn around. Where's Catherine? Have you seen her? Uh, excuse me. Uh, where can I find Catherine? Colin? Colin! Cat! What are you doing here? I, I thought you had traffic court. I did. I got there two hours early, hoping that they could squeeze me in sooner. Which they were able to. I wasn't going to miss this for the world. Why are you so out of breath? I couldn't get a parking space, so I had to park a few blocks down. So I ran. Also, uh, <laughs> these are for you. Oh, they're beautiful. I can't believe you're here. I told you. I'm always going to find my way back to you. I'm always going to find my way back to you. 
Colin's heart pounded harder and harder as he neared her apartment. Not from all the running, rather from the thought of seeing her again. His head swirled with emotions. Regret, love, doubt, excitement. Just because he made it all this way didn't mean he would be welcomed back. He made it all this way, what if she didn't want to see him? It was a risk he was willing to take. He had to see her one more time. At the very least, to say sorry for everything. Very rarely do we get multiple chances to make things right. Colin did not need her love. He already knew that it was long gone. Colin approached the apartment building. He recalled how he helped to move into this building. It was more upscale than the dorm she was in for the majority of their relationship. Though Colin may have only been to this building a handful of times, he could never forget a route that would bring him back to Catherine. Broken glass was scattered across the parking lot and sidewalk. Multiple windows were shattered as he inspected the building, including the glass doors. Carefully, he made his way through where the pane once was and cautiously inspected the lobby. The only light came from the light outside. He went over to the elevator and pushed the button. No response. Impatiently looking around, Colin searched for the stairs. He spotted the door and started running again. His legs and lungs were burning intensely, but he kept striding up the staircase. Already, he felt he had wasted so many moments, but he was determined not to this time. Seven flights of stairs later, he paused for a second at the door frame. He could see her room down the hall. The door was open. Fear kicked in. Did something happen to her? Did someone break in? Did she leave? Was all this for nothing? Slowly, he walked over to her door. Everything was still. He couldn't even hear the commotion from the street. The only thing he could hear was his heart beating in his throat. Colin walked through the open door. He looked around to see if anything was different. Broken, damaged, stolen. The windows seemed intact. The furniture looked relatively untouched. Her TV still stood on the stand in the living room. Everything was turned off. Even the digital clock was blank. He made his way to the kitchen. There, he found a shattered glass upon the floor. Cat? He sheepishly made his way to her bedroom. The door was open just to crack. Cat? He pushed the door open. She was nowhere to be found. Colin ran his hand through his hair in frustration and slammed the wall. He missed her. She could be anywhere in the world at this point. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Ah! He felt broken, lost. Now, in what could be his final moments, he stood in her room all alone. He took a look around. In so many ways, it reminded him of her old college dorm. Her rose bulb string lights hung right below the ceiling. By the window was a small potted plant. She used to love having flowers to care for. On special occasions, instead of getting a bouquet, Colin would get her another plant. He wanted to give her something that would last longer and hopefully not fade away. The room was slightly more messy than he remembered her keeping it, but considering the circumstances, it looked pretty good. On her desk sat unlit, half-melted candles. Colin picked one up as he remembered all the times he went into the candle shop with Cat at the mall. Also on the desk, he spotted the little jewelry box she got for Christmas one year from her mom. He remembered how she loved that box. He also remembered she used to keep the crescent moon earrings he got for her in there. She was obsessed with the sun, the stars, and the moon. Many of their first nights speaking were under the moon. He would be getting out of a shift at the restaurant around midnight, and she would still be up to text him to see how his shift went. Shouldn't you be asleep? Not without saying goodnight. She would usually respond. Colin took a look inside the jewelry box. 
couple necklaces, a couple rings, but no sign of the earrings. She probably got rid of him, he thought. He put the box down on the desk and looked up to see a framed picture and quote of Audrey Hepburn. It read, For beautiful eyes, look for the good in others. For beautiful lips, speak only words of kindness. And for poise, walk with the knowledge that you are never alone. Catherine truly embodied this. She tried to live by it every day, and it always amazed Colin. Regardless of the situation, she always had love in her heart. He could never understand how she remained so pure. Perhaps it was his own jaded spirit that disabled him to comprehend the beauty. A few feet over to the right was her collage of family photos. Colin remembered in her old dorm room staring at these pictures, trying to memorize faces and trying to put names to them. All these people meant a lot to Catherine, so he wanted to make sure he could know as much about them even before meeting them. Between the collage and the Audrey Hepburn photo, there is an open spot with a nail. Something once rested in this spot. Colin looked down to see if it dropped. Nothing was on the floor. He looked around the room to see if a frame was placed somewhere. On her bed, he spotted one frame lying face down. He walked over to the bed and picked it up. He turned it over and he couldn't believe his eyes. Tears again started to well up. It was the painting of the dough that he had bought her on their first date. He took Catherine to a local church carnival. It was a gorgeous, sun-filled summer day, her yellow dress competing with the sun for who could be brighter that day. Amongst all the vendors they visited, they came across a tent of a local artist. She painted and drew the most beautiful of landscapes. This one painting of these lush woods with a majestic doe standing in the clearing, showered by sunlight, caught Catherine's eyes. Colin insisted he buy it for her. He could still picture her big green eyes admirably looking at him, so sweet and so thankful. He couldn't believe that she kept this. Colin's mind wandered to other moments at the fair. There was a petting zoo where people could feed the animals. Colin was terrified, but Catherine dragged him in. Colin could never forget their trip on the Ferris wheel. Catherine's favorite ride growing up was the Ferris wheel, so she insisted they go on it. She didn't have to twist Colin's arm. She was so excited and she cuddled up very close to him. And by pure magic, the Ferris wheel stopped while they were at the very top. They could see out for miles and by that time, the sun was setting behind the mountains in the distance. Colin took one look at her snuggled up against him. They stared into each other's eyes for a moment, and they both softly went in for their first kiss. They always say that you should feel sparks on a first kiss. That's not exactly what Colin felt. He felt as if he'd kissed those lips all of his life. He felt that they were so familiar, so comforting, so sweet and so soft, and in that moment, he was convinced that he would be kissing them for the rest of his life. Colin continued staring at this painting in his hands, awestruck that she never got rid of it. Colin? Startled, Colin jumped and turned to the door. It was Catherine. Her eyes looked red and puffy, as if she'd been crying as well. She was wearing her yellow dress. Her hair was down, but on the left side, her hair was tucked behind her ear. On her ear dangled one of the crescent moon earrings. She was shaking, visibly unnerved. I, I was in the car when I saw you run like an idiot down the street. The best that Colin could do was stare. He was frozen in place. He tried to recall the speech that he'd been practicing in his head. He opened his mouth, but nothing would come out. Shaking, he placed the painting on the bed. They stood six feet apart from each other. For months, Colin had only dreamed of seeing her again, envisioning all the things he would say and do. And at that moment, he couldn't do a thing. Cat, I, um, Catherine broke from the doorway and rushed right into his arms. She grabbed him tight with tears streaming down her face. Colin, again startled, stood there for a second until he realized what was happening. He wrapped his arms around firmly, 
and buried himself into her hair. He too started to sob. They both stood in her bedroom, unable to compose themselves and unwilling to let go of each other. Colin could feel her head pressed up against his chest. The earth began to shake, yet they remained perfectly still. The sounds from the streets erupted once more, yet they remained perfectly quiet. All they could do was hold each other, and unlike any time before, they refused to let go. This has been The End of Us, Part 2. Written by Connor Walsh. Narrated by Stefan Feibel. Colin portrayed by Connor Walsh. Catherine portrayed by Shannon O'Hara. Additional voices by Harrison Mark. Produced and sound designed by Connor Walsh. Additional sound effects provided by freesound.org. To become a patron and support this channel, go to patreon.com slash PorridgeCo. PorridgeCo presents Tales from the Black Box, an anthology series.